Okay, I'm reconvening the Brattleboro Select Board meeting of Tuesday, May 18th, 2021. Uh, we have just returned from our executive session. Uh, we know the meeting was properly warned because I asked Peter at five o'clock and he answered in the affirmative, as they say. Um, so the first order of business is to approve the minutes of May 4th. I'm assuming all of us have had a chance to read them and I entertain a motion. Great. Uh, I move to approve the minutes from our meeting on May 4th. I thank the clerk for his motion and I'll take a vote. Anyone uh, voting to approve the minutes of May 4th, please raise your hand and say aye. 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 There we are, 5-0. Thank you very much. All right, I just, um, I just have one comment this evening. I know there's been a flurry of discussion both nationwide and in our fair town uh, about the need for the select board to discuss the mask mandate. Um, of course, it's not on our agenda for this evening, but I would like us to consider placing it at our next meeting. Um, I would also like to ask our town manager to provide some information to us at our next meeting so that we could understand things like um, the COVID rates currently in our town and vicinity and also the vaccination rates in the town. Um, and I wonder, do, do our fellow select board members have comments to make on this matter? Daniel? Yeah, uh, thanks for bringing that up, Liz. I think it's entirely appropriate. Um, and I too want to be driven by local numbers. Most of the data around vaccination is at the county level. Mm -hmm. um, I'm sure a chunk of the county is us, you know, as one of the, the big places. Um, and also we are a place that abuts other states, other counties, other municipalities. And so I'd be um, equally as interested in learning about the local vaccination rate in case rate um, in, you know, Greenfield, Keene. Um, and again, that stuff's available at the county level, but it's tough to get the actual, you know, town and city level information. Well, we can interrogate Peter on that. Ian, did you have a comment? Yeah, just a very quick one. Uh, Liz, thank you very much for bringing that up. And uh, I really agree on uh, having it put on the agenda for the next uh, warned meeting. And I think in this instance, um, I take a moment to reflect on why the um, uh, following the open meeting law and properly warning meetings and agenda items is so important. Um, you know, this happened so quickly. And one of the things that I've heard from so many people is, is just how, um, you know, this is just suddenly on everyone's plate. And so I, I think it's really important that uh, we let the public know that this is going to be something that we're going to discuss uh, on our in our first June meeting so that everyone can uh, attend who wants to speak on it on the properly warned item. Uh, and uh, I really look forward to hearing from people um, because I understand it's something that, as I've gotten a lot of emails about uh, it's something that people feel really passionate about for a good reason. So I look forward to that discussion. Tim. Thanks, Liz. Um, I agree wholeheartedly and look forward to that discussion as well. Uh, I would also like to request that we take up two other things aside from the mask mandate, and they're both COVID related. So I don't really care whether it's under an umbrella discussion, it's up to the chair and vice chair, of course, or if they're separate agenda items. But I'd like to just briefly discuss um, uh, our plans or thoughts about meeting in person as a select board. And I'd also like to address the issue of deferments on town loans, because uh, there's quite a few businesses who had loans with the town. Some of them are ramping back up and hiring people. Um, so I do think that um, the fact that fiscal year is coming up, I think it might be good timing to just have a discussion about that as well with no 
no, possibly no uh, decision made, but we should start that discussion, if you don't mind. Yeah, well, those are two good things to also be warned so that um, anyone who would like to comment or listen can, can do so. Uh, Peter, is there anything you'd like to say about finding that information? Or, or um, I actually put a, some, an inquiry in already with the health department. I've received some initial response, but it is, I think it wouldn't be responsible to share it tonight because it's partial and explicitly they're digging within their own system for more. They understand what we're looking for, but they're going to dig farther to try to help us with that. So I'll have more interaction with them over the next week or so and make sure that the latest available information is in the backup for next time. Great. I think that's important because, you know, things just in two weeks, things could change quite a bit. Jessica. Um, well, I think it's really important to, to look at those numbers about local data and sort of connected community data. I think it's also important to acknowledge that we are a tourist town on a, on a big highway. So, um, so taking that into consideration as well, particularly for our folks that work in retail and hospitality, um, I think is, is really important. And I don't know what data might be available on that, Peter, but just um, sort of a, some sort of awareness on what the tourism has looked like in the past and may look like this summer, um, I think would be really helpful as well to help us um, better understand that it's not just a local thing, that it is a... Uh, um, yeah. Great, out. Jessica. I couldn't agree more. And I think uh, Daniel got us some data from the chamber that might be useful for our discussion as well. Thanks for bringing it up, Liz. Anytime. Anything else? Oh, let's see. What's next? Manager's comments. I'll have comments on individual items, but I don't have anything right now. Thank you. Great. And are there select board comments or select board committee reports? Daniel. Okay. Um, the Traffic Safety Committee is this Thursday at 8 a.m. Um, the regular backup material is available online on the town's website under the Traffic Safety Committee section, which is findable in the committee's sub menu, um, I guess. And um, Last month, I shared a bunch of that speed data more widely on social media. People had thoughts about it as they uh, want to do. And so if you're interested in like the speeds that the majority of vehicles are driving in your neighborhood, taking a look at that data um, and come into the meeting if you want to, or if not, you can email somebody who's on the committee. The committee's page tells you who is on it. Um, your input is valued and uh, be happy to hear from you. Oh, and I guess one other thing, and I, and I remember saying this last time, I think many people in the community are not aware that there's like a little form that you can fill out on the town's website to um, highlight a safety concern. And it is on the homepage in the bottom right-hand corner and says something along the lines of, safety concern form or something <laughs> like that. I could look at it. I, but. I think it's safety action request. Excuse me for interrupting. Yes. Let me double check that. I think you're probably right. Might be. Those are le much more active words. So yes. Oh, actually. Um, it's an action request. Yeah, Brat Brattleboro safety action form. Something to work on. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> All right, other select book comments. Ian? Yeah, two really quick things. Uh, one, I think this is our first meeting since the first gallery walk of 2021. Uh, and I just wanted to give a quick shout out to uh, just the whole community. Uh, I was there way longer than I was expecting to because I just had so many people to talk to and things to see. Uh, and it's just, uh, I, uh, I'm just so happy that um, it was able to go uh, start off so well. I'm really looking forward to the next one. Um, and I really encourage people to come out, um, support local artists and uh, restaurants and stores. And um, yeah, uh, enjoy the beautiful weather. Um, my second thing is just uh, another really quick shout out, which is to the Brattleboro Words Trail app. 
Um, so I just, I honestly saw this on in the reformer and uh, figured I would give it a download. And um, it was, I, I didn't realize that if you want to do it in your little app uh, application on your phone, you just type in Brattleboro. I was typing in the full thing and it was having a hard time finding it. So you just type in Brattleboro, but it is really cool. <laughs> I, uh, you know, we have such a fascinating town with so much history and um, this, this project is really, really fascinating, and I have already learned a lot. So, just uh, two quick little things. That's it. As Rudyard Kipling would say, just so, Ian. Okay, anyone else? Jessica. I just wanted to give a big shout out to the Brooks Memorial Library in town. Um, last meeting I was there and it was delightful. And now they are open again for limited in-person visits. Um, so I, I checked out a book this weekend and it was great. Mm -hmm. So go in, enjoy the smell of a library um, and get some good reading material. Yeah. Thank you, Jessica. All right then. Um, public participation. Is there anyone from the public who would like to speak about an item which is not on the agenda? Please raise your hand, your little Zoom hand. All right, um, hearing none, let's begin with the consent. Oh, wait, Kurt. Good evening, Kurt. Hello, everybody. Hello. Um, I would like to make a few comments about the short climate emergency declaration resolution that was approved by RTM in 2018 and was amended very beautifully by you all on March 2. Um, there was, it was reported in the reformer rather unfairly, I think, as a um, money saving measure. And it is much more, it has become much more than that. Um, um, at that meeting, um, um, Tim and Tim uh, gave me some recognition personally, uh, crediting me with uh, getting the ball rolling. But I think it's important to note it was Brattleboro Common Sense and many people who started with it in 2010. And so it goes quite a ways back and involves revisions by lots of people and finally approved by RTM in 2018 as a short climate emergency declaration with special attention to note that people were ready to make a sacrifice for um, renewable energy. Um, so it wasn't, you know, it wasn't me, it was Brattleboro Common Sense and the RTM. And at first I was alarmed by the characterization in the reformer as a, um, of it as a, um, that it had been changed into a penny pinching tool. Uh, and I had our economist look it over and he examined the prospectus of the fund and confirms that it is really an awesome, what did he say? Uh, sound, innovative and good for Brattleboro. Uh, so thank you select board for improving that resolution of ours. Um, the only, um, there's only one, well, two little things. I hope the select board should examine its procedures because it should not have taken three years to do that. You know, it was a, a short emergency um, resolution with only one actionable clause. So you should really take a look at that. Uh, and then um, there is a, Lately, some um, a lot of talk about relations between the select board and RTM. And the board should ensure that this action of RTM is well published on the, on the town website, not just because it's an important thing. I mean, everybody knows it's an important thing, but also to recognize that it is a significant action, significant and that it was brought by BCS at RTM. So to recognize RTM, it should be well published on the website. And I hope you can take care of that. Thank you. Thank you, Kurt. Uh, Gary?
Hi, Gary. Oh, there we go. <laughs> All right. On the lighted note, uh, this is Gary Schaub, D2R. And uh, my question is, is it me or has the raise hand feature changed? I'm just trying to get up on the technology. It was blue hands. Now there's like the yellow hand feature. I'm trying to, to incorporate. I just found out that I have to go to reaction versus been the participant box. Where Remember all the blue hands used to be up in that oh. box? You know, Gary, um, I think these are all features of the latest version of Zoom, and that's ah. what we're seeing. There, oh, there is okay. a difference between those, the new and the old. Oh, okay. So that's I thought it was just my computer. <laughs> okay, but uh, but you didn't happened. come on just to talk about your little hand. You must well, have to see how everybody's doing. And I've been a uh, man about the street. Nothing going on right now downtown until we'll see what happens when. Uh, next time we meet with Peter to see what restrictions and what's going on. I got my two shots. I'm feeling great. Uh, ready to get out there and start uh, getting some things going in the town for July. Hopefully we'll have some uh, good events and some other things coming up. Don't forget about June, Gary. Oh, yeah, that's right. What is June? What's going on in June? <laughs> I'm kind of lost. So much. Starting with another gallery walk. It's just ah like yes, yes, the gallery walk. Correct, yes, and hopefully some of these other uh, areas are going to be opening up outside I, um, with the gallery walk. I guess the library doing their sidewalk sales. Is that something that might be hopefully coming soon with the sidewalk sales to get more people into town and you know gathering together? So once like I said, we're going to wait to see what the final uh, transition is going to be with the new implica implication with the new no mass feature. So I'm looking forward to see where we're at with that. But I say keep it safe, stay safe and be safe. Gary, you just stay tuned because that's it. We'll be discussing <laughs> it at our next meeting. Excellent. You guys, thank you so much. Keep up the good work and I'll tune in then. Thank you, Gary. Thank you. Gary, see you. All right. Is there anyone else from the public who would like to raise their hand? Seeing none, let me ask Peter to begin a discussion of our consent agenda. Sure, so there are um, more items than usual on the consent agenda tonight. Um, I'll reiterate just quickly that um, the use of the consent agenda is intended to um, cluster together items where um, the action appears not to require debate. Um, where it seems straightforward enough, it's either following up on a prior direction of the board or uh, it's just a routine item like making a low bid purchase. There are some of each of those um, on this consent agenda. I wanna reiterate that um, at any time, a select board member who thinks something that is listed on the consent agenda should be um, pulled off of it and discussed. Any one select board member can do that and it would then become the final item of discussion in under the um, new business part of the agenda tonight. Um, and finally, something you're well aware of, but I want to make sure the public is aware of, is in the administrative report, there's not only full backup materials in the select board's backup for each of these different items, but in the administrative report, there's actually a separate paragraph that says explicitly what the action is that you'll be taking if you do approve the consent agenda as it is presented to you tonight. So that it's really clear that when you do these as a group, um, it, there's no sort of... Um, um, you know, muddying up of what is the particular action on a particular item. With that as the background, staff is recommending that you approve the consent agenda as it is presented to you tonight. Um, and then we move on into the discussion items for the meeting. Okay. Would anyone, uh, Ian, yes? Yeah, I'd like to make a motion. Uh, and before I make the motion, I just want to say I'm, uh, I really like that. Uh, Peter, adding the um, additional information in the uh, administrative report that makes it very clear, um, especially for one like this that's so long. Um, and I also really like seeing the consent agenda being used uh, so so well. You know, this really will help to make our meeting more efficient. So with that said, I'd like to move to approve the consent agenda as presented. Thank you, Ian. Ian has made a motion to approve the consent agenda. And uh, I'd like to have, take a vote. All select board members who would approve the consent agenda, please raise your hand and say aye. 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 
And there we are, unanimously approving the consent agenda. Thank you very much. All right. Uh, would someone like to make a motion so that we can convene as water and sewer commissioners? I move to convene as water and sewer commissioners. Great. All in favor of convening as water and sewer commissioners, please raise your hand and say aye. Aye. Um, I've just counted to five, so thank you very much. Uh, the proposed FY22 utilities fund budget, continued consideration and possible adoption. Let me ask Peter to start that off. Thank you. Um, so two weeks ago tonight, um, we presented the utilities fund budget. Um, there were um, no, there were some good questions and some good discussion around it, but no changes requested at that time. So the numbers that are back before you this evening are the same as what was originally proposed by staff and the same as what you gave tentative approval to last time. We are asking this evening that unless we bump into an issue that cre creates a concern for you, that you um, uh, actually take the official action of adopting this budget for FY22. Um, in the meantime, I do want to ask that Dan Tyler um, come into the meeting and um, be available for any additional questions you might have about the utilities budget, but particularly to spend a couple of minutes presenting the um, capital program. That was my oversight in the last meeting. We were moving along so efficiently and you were pleased with what we had brought you. And so we you know, spent good time, Dan did, and, and uh, describing the operating budget um, that's proposed for the utilities. And we spent a little bit of time on talking about the cash reconciliation in the fund. Um, we didn't spend any time talking about capital and we think that it's important given some of the significant work that's planned this year there, it's important to spend a couple of minutes on that. Uh, so I'll turn it over to Dan. Great. Good evening, Hello. Mr. Tyler. All right. So the, the capital plan, um, these, for the most part, these numbers are pulled from the long-term capital plan spreadsheet that we've been working with for the last couple of years. Um, you'll notice there's a there's a column there for carry forward items um, that that includes projects that are in long-term plan that you know funds are set aside for and also includes projects that may have been in last year's budget that we didn't get to um, or or in progress now. That list looks a little bigger this year. I think we definitely experienced some delays related to the pandemic and getting projects completed last year. Um, most of those are in the works or will be soon. Um, and then the next column is the, the FY22 requests. Um, many of these are annual requests. Um, things like the, the water meters, um, sewer mains and manholes, uh, the tightening items, those are, the, those are annual requests that we use for maintenance. Um, the, there's money set aside again, or funds for the future projects, including the Hinsdale Bridge, uh, the big Putney Road project that's coming down the road. And also some, some pump station work that we're looking forward to um, and hoping to get some engineering started on. All of these are projects that have been on the list um, that we've been anticipating for this budget cycle. The two, the two new ones are the retreat wells roof that item's been lingering on the plan for a while. Um, we, we worked with an engineer to draft up specs and plans for that. We put it out to bid and the bids didn't come back favorable. We did some more research and it looks like that project's gonna um, require a little bit more funding. So there's an additional $14,000 um, for that item. And the other bigger item is the um, riverfront capacity project. And that is, that is a project to upgrade the water service in the area of um, Bridge Street and Depot Street down, down along the river to Barrows, Whetstone. Um, we've talked to Amtrak and we're hoping to, it looks like we're gonna be able to incorporate this project into their upgrade of the railroad station. 
And that would work through a reimbursement agreement where they would install all the requested water infrastructure within the limits of their project. And then we'd be responsible for bringing a line down Bridge Street to connect to, to their project. Um, they, there's a huge advantage to working with them on this because we need to get that line under the tracks. And, and that's the big limitation. Uh, and they're gonna be doing a lot of work in and around the tracks. And you know, it's, they, they, that's what they do. So it's easier for them to, to get the line under the tracks than it ever would be for us. So we, we really feel that this is the time to take advantage of that project to improve the service down there. Currently, it, it's an undersized line. Um, there's not adequate water for fire protection in that area. And the restaurant would like to install a fire protection system, but there's not water. Um, this would this would bring enough water down for that. It would add some hydrants um, down by the Barrows area and, and really just improve that entire area um, for the future and any future expansion that happens down there. Uh, and then we, then we have the column for the fleet. Um, this year, just a couple pieces of equipment. One of them is a service truck. Uh, currently, that's a full-size pickup. Um, we're looking into more fuel efficient alternatives. Um, that, that pickup is, is the pickup I drive. Um, it's primarily used for commuting back and forth and traveling from project to project. It doesn't need to be a full-size pickup at this point. In the past, it was kind of shared. Um, it, there was a, we were lacking vehicles and it was used more frequently by the mechanics, um, but they, they have a vehicle now that they use um, and it just, it happens less and less. Um, so we'd like to, to look into a different alternative for that. And the second vehicle is also a pickup truck. Um, this is used at the wastewater treatment plant um, for their snow plowing and maintenance and whatnot. Um, that we're just, we're looking to in, uh, replace that in kind with a, a similar truck. Um, they, they need that truck for what they do with it. Um, th those are the highlights I wanted to hit. If anyone has any questions, happy to try to answer them. I had something. Go ahead, Tim. Um, and it's, I think I know the answer to this because I'm recalling a conversation I had briefly, Dan, but um, when you look at the Hinsdale Bridge water relocation, there's an FY22 assignment of 126 and also a 23. Can you just remind us, is that, is that just because we're, um, we're, uh, we're fortunate to have good timing on the progress of that? And so can split that expense or is, because we do that, have to get a lot of work planned. done before, before the bridge. Yeah, we were down. anticipating the construction and we had a couple of years, I think of 50, where we, we set aside and worked on the engineering. And then we've got a couple of years of the 126 to complete the project. Um, and by the time that project's completed, we'll be into that final year. Right, okay. And yeah, that's the same out. with the uh, Putney Road project. We've, we've kind of done the same thing with that. We've set, set funds aside for that project that hopefully is coming in the future. Yeah, that just keeps, <laughs> keeps eluding us a little bit maybe, but, but the Hinsdale Bridge one does feel very real because of these um, very real projects we have to get done in preparation for that. So I just wanted to kind of highlight that for people who were wondering what that might be. It, it highlights the coordination and benefits of the capital plan and the work that you're doing to coordinate with these other big projects. Absolutely. Ian. Hey, Dan. Is the um, FY23, I think it's 373,000 for the retreat in Wilson's Woods pump station. Um, is that like a, what, what is that? So the, the retreat pump station is down beside the meadows. That's a sewer pump station that 
picks up flows from the Grafton cheese and uh, retreat farm area and pumps it up to Putney Road. Um, that, that pump station is due for an upgrade. Um, same with w Wilson's Wood is a sewer pump station that's down at the bottom of the hill and pumps the waste back up to the top of the hill. So those are um, just upgrades, timely upgrades, maintenance items. Okay, great. All right, are there any more select board members who have comments to make or questions for Dan or Peter? Hearing none, let's hear what Gary has to say. So hi, Dan, uh, quick question, Gary Shroud, Detour. Uh, amongst the many projects I know that are on the slate, and the major ones, is the Canal Street project on any of those timetables at all as far as the sidewalks, especially one going down where I'm at from Clark Street going down because of the uneven. I spoke to Steve and I know that was something we spoke about last year during the holiday season. We were waiting for the stimulus money and all this. So I was just wondering where that was at on that lineage, if we have been pushed up or still something that's gonna be on a pole until these other projects get completed. And I guess the second one, I noticed a green line on Putney Road where the bikes are. And I just didn't know what that was about. And I didn't know if that was a continuation of a, of a starting project. So can you fill me in? Or maybe Peter can, huh? okay. <laughs> you all wanna answer that one. I can speak to those, um, if that's all right, Liz. Sure. So um, the Putney Road one first, that's actually something where we asked VTrans to make, we, we were asked by members of the public um, to ask VTrans to um, do some interim safety improvements. There was some discussion in this item just a few minutes ago about a, a longer term, very large scale improvement that VTrans is planning. It'll be when it, when it happens, it'll be the largest project they've constructed in Vermont in quite a while. Um, that will be, it'll include several roundabouts. It'll go all the way from the West River to um, uh, exit uh, three um, and a you know complete reconstruction of the roadway. So we've got major water work and sewer work to do under the ground in preparation for that project. It, in, uh, some reassuring news, I had swallowed this one earlier. I wasn't gonna interrupt for it, but <laughs> talking about Putney Road, um, that, that project, you know, like the Hinsdale Bridge feels like it, you'll never actually get to the place where it's being constructed. We're just always going to be talking about it. Um, but that's because of the scale of it. There's actually a lot of very active work being done around it um, in preparation for the construction. And then it's going to be several years of construction. So um, I don't know exactly when we'll see, you know, the, the, the work begin more actively out there. Um, but in the meantime, because that is a few years away, and because we've got increased bike and, and pedestrian use of Putney Road, um, again, we were approached by folks in the community. We then approached VTrans and VTrans was very receptive to this and installed at uh, Town Crier Drive to get people across the street, across Putney Road at sort of the crown of that curved hill, um, a, an RRFB, a, one of the push button flashing light crosswalks that's a safer way for pedestrians to get across a busy street like that. So um, VTrans put that in. VTrans is in the process of putting in at Hannaford um, a crosswalk across uh, Putney Road that's already been painted. And the, the switching equipment is on its way. It'll be in, installed within the next month to um, actually have a dedicated walk signal at that location like what we have downtown so that people can get safely across between the Colonial and uh, the Hannaford plazas. Um, and then the green bike lanes are because they pop visually so much more clearly for people. And that's an area that the bicyclists in Brattleboro have been especially concerned about that, you know, the lines fade, but even more than that is just the, the busyness of the traffic in that area. Right. Um, and so by having these green painted lanes through the intersection areas, it's just safer for the bicyclists. It's easier for the motorists to see that. Um, that's, that's all being a, done at state expense. Right. Um, so that, that was a big, big, victory actually for the community to get that kind of responsiveness and helpfulness from VTrans. And then um, the sidewalk project that you mentioned, Gary, is actually part of, of the general capital improvement program of the town using general fund monies. 
And tonight we're talking about the utilities fund. So that, that's why you're hearing about pump stations and pipes and um, things that aren't sidewalks. Um, but, but we have in recent years allocated additional funds to sidewalks. It's possible that there might be some allocation beyond that to sidewalks coming from the ARPA money. That's something that the select board is going to be discussing as the summer, you know, spring moves into summer. Um, so there's, there's some conversations yet to be had around sidewalks, but that's not right on point with tonight's utilities fund budget. Oh, okay. I see. And, then, and that's, like I said, it was interesting. I didn't see it in I Bradbury about the, you know, the little green line there. It was just interesting to see. And I've been seeing a lot of the, uh, also with the board of grammar consolidated, putting up a lot of wiring. Also, does that have to do with the new broadband we're getting or something? I mean, you've seen the trucks all over putting up yeah, stuff. So I was just trying to, just trying to figure out what's going on basically with, with that. The consolidated project is installation of fiber optic cables all throughout the town. And that's going to prove Wi-Fi capability because I still don't have any Wi-Fi pretty much unless I go to the library. So and there's no 5G out there, people. So don't get 5G phones. <laughs> so I it's, like a, to push that. it's a private choice each household needs business makes about who to do business with for the provision of Internet services. But, yes, that's what that's what Consolidated's upgrade is for, is to um, improve Internet service. Oh, OK. And that's just for Consolidate, not with Comcast or that's just a, does it. Oh, OK. So that's probably another issue that I guess is going to be brought up sometime. I know today or next meeting about the broadband, I guess. Um, that's that's a private project by a private company that the town is not directly involved with. We're we're happy right. to have some competition. Private marketplace is going on, and I think yeah, we we definitely need it. <laughs> okay. Thank you, so Harry. Much. All set. Thank Absolutely you. Absolutely appreciate it. Great. All right. Um, oh, James Anderson cannot be heard. Hi, Mr. Tyler. Thank you so much for explaining the needs of the uh, Public Works Department regarding the public dump truck. I'm hoping you can explain in the manager's report, there was an estimated cost of $180,000 for this specific piece of equipment. It looks like it's come significantly under budget, nearly $25,000. What is that attributable to? And does that speak to the longevity of the truck? Um, are you expecting the life of this vehicle to be 10 years? And then if you could just also speak briefly to um, how the truck is useful to the community, what it's used for uh, and why that cost is uh, so high. The, uh, the estimate for the budget was based on previous purchases and the, the bids actually came in significantly less than they had in the past. Um, this is, like the standard dump truck, public works dump truck that you see all around town. They're used for plowing in the winter. In the summer, they're used for hauling gravel to the to the dirt roads um, for grading and asphalt for patching. And they're, they're pretty much used daily around town um, for various different uses. Um, yeah. All right. Um... So questions have been asked and answered, and I would entertain a motion from one of my fellow select board members. Daniel. All right, uh, I move to adopt the FY22 utilities fund budget as presented. Thank you, Daniel. Daniel has moved to adopt the FY22 utilities fund budget as presented. Um, let's have a vote of select board members. All in favor, please raise your hand and say aye. 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 Okay, five zero, the motion has carried. Thank you very much. All right, on to unfinished business. The proposed FY22 parking fund budget. And again, we look to Mr. Elwell. Thank you. Um, this one is a little different. Um, whoop, Daniel. I think Jessica knows. I, I want to give Jessica the pleasure. <gasps> oh, thank you, Daniel. Well, I, I just um, really wanted to use this new word. Um, I would like to move that we adjourn as water and sewer. Oh. <laughs> yes. well, thank you, Jessica. The All right. Nailed it. Shall we adjourn as uh, water and sewer commissioners? 
all select board members, raise your hand and say aye. 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 Special aye. thanks to Jessica. <laughs> okay. So Peter, that's please, actually the new please. theme. As, as you keep us on the straight and narrow for procedures, um, part of the explanation of what's happening with the parking fund budget is also a thank you um, to a question that, that Jess asked last meeting. Um, so I'll leap right to that and then come back to the bottom line. Um, you will recall that there was um, a, a bit more um, uh, lengthy and complex, complex discussion of the parking fund budget as compared to the discussion that also occurred last week uh, or two weeks ago regarding the utilities fund, because frankly, the parking fund, as we all know, is the one place that was significantly affected by COVID. And um, it's led us into some um, uh, need to be really clear about what is happening in that fund that is unusual and how we plan to address it and come out of uh, this situation and um, stabilize. So um, in the course of that longer and more complicated conversation, we were asked about the parking fines revenue line item. And um, at the time, didn't mean to skip over that, but, but realized Patrick and I did after the meeting that uh, we had answered. It was one of several items that was included in a, a set of questions. We answered the others. We didn't answer that one. We realized after the meeting we had, and then we did some more analysis on it. And what we realized there is that contrary to much of the rest of the operations in the fund where, um, the continued impacts of COVID kind of reflected um, what, what had been abnormal in FY19. Uh, yep, what was abnormal in, in um, um, FY19 about the operation of the fund. Nope, sorry, FY20. So in FY20, we came in under um, on both expenses and particularly on revenues and ran a deficit there. In um, FY21, our operations have been relatively more normal, but our revenues have still been way down. The budgeting for FY22 was especially difficult because of these abnormalities um, and because it's hard to predict exactly how the recovery in FY22 might occur. Will it end up being pretty much a normal year or will it still be bumpy as we come out of COVID? So in some of the other areas, it was clear that we should project lower revenues than normal, but a little better than the rock bottom year of FY20. And that's what we did. And that's what we explained. The, as we looked further at parking fines, what we found is this past year, even though the, the collections for what people were paying to use the parking system were down, the fines assessed against the violations within the parking system were pretty stable. They were down also, but very little, five or $10,000 instead of tens of thousands of dollars. And the reason why is because our staff was still out enforcing the parking restrictions. We had a conversation about that back in the middle of COVID of the importance of maintaining parking enforcement operations so that the system would function properly and the higher demand spaces that were getting used would be able to be used the way they're intended um, in a sort of a, you know, have enough turnover there that the broader public is able to, to use the system the way it's intended. So the, um, the efficiency of the parking enforcement staff actually kept the fine revenue up relatively more normal. Um, so what we're suggesting here is that the $86,750,000 that was in there um, in the original budget that we brought to you two weeks ago, um, we think that's too low. And we think upon reflection that um, $105,000 is a more appropriate funding level or, or projection of what that revenue will be for FY22. We have made that change, incorporated that into the budget that is brought back for your approval tonight. That budget is otherwise unchanged from what you saw two weeks ago. But with that addition, um, there's a slightly better bottom line for FY22 and um, slightly less of an overall deficit in the in the position of the fund. You'll recall that um, you know we've had sort of three years of negative impact from COVID financially on the fund, and anticipate using some of the ARPA uh, money to to um, restore stability to the parking fund. But um, the that that problem got a little lightened. You know, it's not a not a huge amount of money. Um, positive impact here to this change that we think is prudent to make based on the more careful examination of the numbers. So thank you for raising the question. And um, that's what's before you tonight. 
that relates to the budget that we're asking you to approve. There is one other question that you asked and um, I think a desire that you expressed collectively. Um, we shared that desire, we were hopeful about it. And that is um, the potential of doing the entire deck ceiling project in the transportation center instead of uh, just the, um, the work at the seams of the, um, uh, where the slabs come together. The, uh, when we looked into that further, what we found was um, when the town found that we didn't have sufficient funds at the time of the bidding for this work to proceed with the entire project, and we slimmed it down to just working at those joints, the, uh, what we found in the bids from the contractors was there was a bidder who was the low bidder for the joints part of the project who got that bid award and is actually at this moment doing that work. There was a different contractor who had provided the best overall bid, the combination of the joint piece and all the rest of the deck ceiling was a different contractor. We found ourselves in a legal catch 22. We couldn't award the larger job to the contractor that has mobilized and is doing the, the work at the joints because they weren't the low bidder for that work. And we couldn't award to the whole job to the person who was the low bidder for that work because we had already awarded the smaller portion of work to the contractor who's out there working. And that's why we allowed the project to just move forward. It is getting constructed. This first piece will be completed here in the next couple of weeks. And it, the broader body of work there that needs to be done at the transportation center will be something we'll need to talk about together later this summer. That does not have an impact on the operating budget that is before you for approval tonight, it will have a, an impact on the um, uh, fund balance decision and the amount of ARPA funding that is committed to propping back up the fund balance for the operating losses in this fund from COVID. Thank you. Are there comments from select board members regarding the parking fund budget? I think it's been thoroughly digested in the in the past 14 days. Uh, are there any comments from the public regarding the parking fund budget? We could very well be ready then for a motion and a vote. I can make a motion. Thank you, Tim. To adopt the FY22 parking fund budget as just presented. Great. Tim has made a motion to adopt the FY22 parking fund budget as presented. All select board members in favor, please raise your hand and say aye. 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 And here we are, 5-0. The motion has carried. Thank you very much. All right. Um, new business. I, I note that we don't have to adjourn as parking fund commissioners. <laughs> Um, new business is the proposed ski jumper sculpture. Peter, would you like to address us? Sure, thank you. And um, I, I see that we also have the representatives from uh, Harris Hill have joined us. Um, so uh, they'll speak to this matter in a moment. I'd like to provide a quick summary. Um, okay. so we, we were approached um, by the um, Harris Hill Ski Jump Incorporated team, uh, the board there. Um, with an offer of a ski jump sculpture that is um, some representations are shown in your backup, some photographs of an actual sculpture of this type from Europe and some renderings of what it might look like here in Brattleboro. Um, uh, we as staff have reviewed this matter, looked at some alternative sites with the Harris Hill team, um, discussed some of the aspects of you know, what, what is required for um, uh, installing this properly and making sure that it doesn't block the view of the traffic in the location that's proposed. And um, we're at a point in our review where we think it's ready for the select board to um, hear from the folks who are proposing to make this gift to the town um, and decide whether or not you'd like for the town to receive this gift and allow it to be um, placed for public view um, uh, out in either the um, specifically proposed location or some other location here in Brattleboro. Um, it is representative of the 100 years of ski jumping at, at uh, Harris Hill, and we're coming up on that 100th anniversary. Um, and uh, we, the staff, are um, 
recommending that if you do wish to accept this, that we think it would be appropriate to designate um, a period of time each year in the advance of the annual ski jump. It's an international ski jumping competition in February each year. The request was to allow it um, in December, January, and February. Um, and so we on staff are recommending that you say yes to that if you do find the overall um, project to be something you wish to support. Great. Um, do we want to hear from Ms. Hall about presenting the, uh, the sculpture? Now that I figured out how to unmute myself. Well, there you go. I'm Pat mm -hmm. Howell. Uh, I'm president of Harris Hill Ski Jump. And this is Mel Martin, who um, is part of the volunteer group and is overseeing, also my husband, <laughs> and is overseeing uh, the uh, technical aspects of this project, if you so approve. And so we are very excited about it. And Peter, thank you so much for that introduction. Um, uh, we were looking for a way to really celebrate one way of many uh, to celebrate the hundred years of Harris Hill Ski Jump. And uh, one, of our, so one of our friends saw this sculpture in, in Austria and sent us a photo of it. And we were so taken by, uh, by it. I, you do have photos of it, is that correct? Yes. Okay. They have the four photos that you provided to us. Okay, perfect. So you, so you can see how, um, how compelling it is. And we wanted, uh, we wanted Brattleboro to um, celebrate this with us. Of course, you always, you celebrate the ski jump with us every year. Um, but a, this special event, this 100th anniversary and this sculpture. So we'd like you to um, authorize us to install this sculpture in uh, December. Okay, thank you, Pat. And we're so, happy to answer any questions you might have. Great. So select board members, do we, do we have comments? Jessica. Sure. So... So in a normal world, when we have a fully functioning arts committee, this would usually go to them first, right? And then um, they would make a recommendation to us from their expertise in the arts. And That's correct. And staff makes no representation of having expertise in the arts. We, we looked at functional questions related to this, not artistic questions. <clears throat> Great. Um, so I'm curious, Patricia, do you have an artist on your team that's that's working with you on this? Um, I'll turn that over to Mel. What we what we have um, come to realize is that we don't need a um, an artist per se to start from scratch. Um, that what we're doing is we're taking this concept that was uh, that we found in Austria, uh, and by creating our own version of it. I don't want to understate by using the word <clears throat> uh, construct, but really what we're doing is modeling, modeling our, our version, if you will, after theirs. And so the artistry that you would normally expect if it were to be a sculpture sitting on Main Street is dramatically different. So to that degree, uh, I can manage from the creative side uh, what our jumper will look like. And it will look similar to, but different from what you see there. Um, and uh, then it's a matter of as much as anything is, is to, to get it to uh, be constructed, both the jumper itself and also the, uh, the, uh, the frame, the frame itself, where the, you see two versions, you see one where the frame is squared and one where it's arched. And uh, so it, it, we're not sure what it's gonna be there. But the idea is that um, it's, there's a lot of engineering and mechanics into this, and uh, we don't need a artist per se to direct it. And the other question I have for you guys is, um, since it is based on another existing sculpture, have you guys reached out to that artist or that yes. team? I, just checking on copyright 
infringement and any any of those concerns that might sure. we have and we have yeah the the company that makes it uh, that made that does these kinds of things in uh well at least in austria uh, maybe beyond we don't know but they've got their website we've talked uh talked to them they've gone back and forth and they so, do festivals and right lighting, lighting kinds of things and this is an example so yeah that's not an issue they don't mind in other words that you're copying their art no no now we have direct communication with a gentleman by the name of peter uh look at his last name and uh so absolutely not and, and, really, and it, with the town that it, yeah. and where it hangs and, and really so. this is this would not be a copyright issue anyway because we're doing we're doing our own yeah it's like if you want to build a building and i'm going to build a building uh we're both building buildings but there's no copyright and it's more along that line that it is trying to uh, you know, copy a specific uh, copyrighted design, something. It doesn't fall into that, uh, into that realm. And where will it be fabricated if I could continue on Jessica's line of questioning? Here in Brattleboro. Here in Brattleboro, great, okay. With one possible exception. If we do the arched uh, frame, that might have to come from someplace like, uh, the pipe might have to come from Chicago, where I did a previous sign, uh, where the pipe came from Chicago, was sent to another Chicago fur company to bend it, and then sent east to have it uh, sandblasted and powder coated down in like Westfield, Massachusetts, and then installed here. So it's conceivable that that frame would be something that uh, starts in another location and comes here. The skier itself, um, if we do the way, uh, if is constructed the way we want to, it may well be manufactured, <laughs> made, if you will, in uh, central Massachusetts. But it's all going to be, you know, uh, happening from here. Uh, anything we can do here will always be done from here because it's easier. But some parts of the construction may well take place elsewhere. Right. And I just want to mention that there is a sandblasting and powder co coating company here in Brattleboro. Yeah, in coating. Yeah, we know them. Great. Right. Um, other comments? Tim? Uh, well, Ian and I were fighting it out, but I'm just going to go ahead. <laughs> um, so I ha just have to say, I think this is a fantastic idea. I'm really excited about it, especially since we all were mourning the loss of uh, uh, I guess the 99th or whatever we <laughs> last um, year. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. it's great. And I really appreciate the thoughtfulness of the placement and the soaring jumper because it not only ensures that somebody walking at that crosswalk would not lose their line of sight, which is very important for pedestrian safety, but it also provides a sort of soaring thing that everyone will be driving by and right. walking by. So, um, it's just, uh, you know, even in the rough stages that we're looking at it, it seems like a wonderful idea and as well as being lit up, if that's still the plan, so. It is. In oh, fact, yeah. it's the fact that it comes to life at night that is really the, uh, it was the key to it. Yeah. So, and as you uh, know, it in December, that'll be four o'clock. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't want to think about that right now. It's still light up, so. but yeah, good point. And Thank to you. your, to that one point, um, not to cut you off, Ian, the, the bottom of the skier will probably somewhere be in the vicinity of eight feet above the ground, mm -hmm. um, give or take. Uh, we don't know the exact size. In other words, the dimension, the height and width of the, uh, of the jumper yet, approximately. But So it's conceivable that um, the, what we're trying to do here is make sure that anybody who walks should choose to walk under it for whatever reason is not going to be able to reach up and hit yeah. it or, or, or feel like hitting it. So discourage, discourages pull-ups. Yes, Jim, that's right. Yeah. Great. Uh, Ian. Yeah, thank you both uh, so much for your presentation. Um, you know, I, I really uh, echo Tim. I think it's great. Um, I can just see it in my mind already, how beautiful it's going to be, um, especially that time of year. Uh, I am uh, very familiar with that intersection of Walnut and um, Putney Road and Main Street, kind of that three uh, 
uh, that double uh, crosswalk. It's uh, I walk it to work every day and back from work every day on it. Um, so I just kind of want to pick at it a little bit um, just for because I use it all the time. And I don't know if this would be directed to Peter or, or um, but the only thing that I'm, I, I just want to talk about is, so the time of year is going to be heavy snowfall. So that island gets very high with snow. And then if you have a structure that can collect snow, I, I know that I have to check pretty far down what is Putney Road at that point when I'm crossing the seconds uh, uh, over to Walnut because people can drive really fast on that road coming up uh, onto Putney, uh, like mm -hmm. into real Putney Road. Um, and so I'm, a, I'm, I'm a, I think it's a great location um, and I, I, I don't have any problem with it. I just really wanna make sure that um, that's been considered um, for the height and everything. Peter? Thank you. Yeah, um, so anecdotally, I also use the double crosswalk there frequently and I know exactly what you're talking about. And um, we have had um, chronic problems there in the summer because of the growth of the vegetation. Mm. Um, and so there are volunteers who maintain that and we know who to contact and we do, and they're always responsive to come out and cut it down. But we do, you know, we kind of have to stay on top of that in the warm weather months um, when the, the shrubs there can grow up high enough to really block those views. Winter hasn't been as much of an issue for us, although as you point out, you know, in periods of, you know, when winters with a lot of snowfall, it can collect there in a way that is problematic. Um, we don't think that the, we, the town staff, don't think that the addition of the, the sculpture at that location would, would compound that problem to any degree because of its height and because the um, expectation is that the frame upon which it will be placed will be pretty narrow. So it'll be, you know, more like looking past a street sign post mm -hmm. than some other object that would be more of a blockage. And I, I should say that in our first impression, when we were first approached by the Harris Hill team about this, um, we actually had a greater concern about these maintaining these line of sites. We, we were, um, didn't fully understand what was being proposed. We thought it would create a hazard that was unacceptable. And we um, asked them to look at other sites and we did together consider a few other sites they were um, <laughs> politely persistent, <laughs> uh, bringing us back to this site. And um, in our further analysis of it, particularly with the details about how high it would hang and what the frame, you know, sort of what space the frame would occupy, um, staff became satisfied that this would not create a hazard either to motorists or to pedestrians. Great. <laughs> And I can add one thing just to, on the very nature of the skier itself, you'll see that there, it'll be very, very difficult for snow to collect in any way, shape or form. Uh, the slightest bit of breeze would take any light snow away. So uh, and if, even if it were somehow manageable that it <clears throat> could, it would still be above the line of sight. So I think you're gonna see uh, you know, the, the skier itself uh, pose no issue in terms of collecting snow. That's that's great. I am looking forward uh, for it to illuminate my walk home in December when it's dark at four. <laughs> I might want to add one thing. In the four, uh, the images that you saw, um, <coughs> the two that were created by one of the committee members uh, may have the uh, installation appear to be probably bigger than it actually will be. Um, and it's hard to say to try to put something uh, more specific to that, but it looks, and I think in real life, it won't be as large as you see there. Uh, we're gonna make it as large as possible, but um, that's the only, the only nuance that I would, uh, and you may not even know the difference if you see it compared to uh, yep. when it's finally installed to that. But it, uh, if somebody were sensitive to it, they'd say, oh, it looks smaller. It may be smaller than what you see in those representations. It will still be life-size. Yeah, it'd be a lot bigger than life-size. My, my goal is to make it life-size plus. So, again, we're still in the process of designing it, so I can't give specifics. Very good, okay. Thanks. Um, I noted in the memo that the initial request was was really about you know the centennial um, anniversary and celebrating that, and and then there was um, a subsequent request that that this stay up 
well, not stay up, but go up seasonally moving forward. Um, it seems like the board is largely positive about this, but I, I did kind of want to at least invite a discussion about whether or not we wanted to say, let's do this, where there are still some things to be worked out about what this is even going to look like and how it will sit within the, the landscape there, um, or whether we want to just say, let's do it for this centennial year, you know, which is very important to Mark, and then come back and take another look at it. So I just want to propose that. It's not... Well, a hard no for me, but I you just know what, Daniel? That's an interesting concept because um, I'm. I think it's great just the type of seasonal art that a community like Brattleboro can rally around, especially with its historic precedent. Um, and I and I thank the Harris group for suggesting it. There's two things that I'd like to see that are kind of along the same thread as Daniel's. First is that um, if we were to approve the skier, that the town staff, whoever the appropriate town staff would be, would, would oversee its installation and, and overview the, the, structural engineering stability of the structure, but also that we should revisit it at some point. First of all, we should have the right to revisit this approval if there's any sort of glitch or unforeseen circumstance. Um, but also we might wanna have some sort of a, a, a time period like a, to say, okay, well, let's try it for a year or maybe five years, and then just make sure that everyone is still on board with it because it's such a, a novel idea. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there may be some unforeseen things that obviously we can't foresee. So uh, how does everyone feel about kind of Daniel's issue and my concerns uh, about formulating a, a plan going forward. You mean if we don't like it? <laughs> well, not so much if we don't like it, but if there's some sort of hazardous condition or, you know, like it, it, it seems like it's like too bright or, you know. And any sort of nuisance factor, like a, like a, like a zoning thing, you know. I also do think that without the, um, without a town arts committee functioning and making recommendations and and talking about how it aesthetically works with the landscape um, there, I, I would like to, um. Yeah, have a, a temporary option rather than a yes for the rest of forever. This can exist here. Great. Well, can we settle on something like um, like two years and then reassess? Do do we? What do you think, Dan? I mean, I think one year is completely appropriate. If we're going to reassess it, let's have it sit for its season. Let's, let's mm -hmm. celebrate this centennial and then let's, you know, and let's revisit and see how it went. Um, we've done that with other things during the last year, you know, ordinance changes, whatnot. So it's, I'm not trying to say, I think this is a bad idea. I just don't want to agree to, we'll do it every winter until somebody says, no, I would much rather say, let's do it this winter because it represents a very special winter. And then let's come back to it and see how we feel about it. And I think that, um, Liz, your point about, you know, making sure that the structural kind of aspects of it are, you know, totally something that we are happy with is absolutely appropriate. I did have yeah. a, a follow-up question on that comment that you made, Liz. Please. Um, which was, um, so my, my assumption is that the, the ski jumping group will own this structure um, and will be responsible for maintenance and insurance of this structure. Okay. Peter. Uh, yes. yes. 
that's our understanding as well, that this is something that would be placed, whether it's for the one time or whether it's annually, that the placement will be the response. The fabrication of it is their responsibility. The placement of it is their responsibility. Um, the we, we will make sure that it is um, insured for being placed as you know something that is out in the public right away. We'll work on that piece together. The one um, nuance to this idea about the sort of structural integrity question or, or concern, um, I'd like to make sure that it's not for a select board action or an understanding of that action that that the town staff is responsible for actually, um, um, you know, determining those things, but rather for that, that, that the determination that is made in the design and in the intended placement, the structure upon which it'll sit would be subject to our review and approval. That's completely consistent with the way that other things have been allowed to be placed in the public right of way from time to time, where the responsibility for the thing stays with the person who's placing it and the town reserves the right to approve or disapprove how it's going to be placed. We don't have any problem right. with that. Um, uh, that makes sense. My concern or our concern about um, whether it's um, put up for this year and then you'll decide whether you want to approve it for, for future years. Um, if, if it could be stated in a way that it would be your intention to approve it for future years, I think we'd feel more comfortable because it's a considerable amount of effort and money uh, to build this thing. And if it were, if we, if it were only one year, I'm not sure we would do it. Um, and so if you want to reserve judgment, I would hope that the verbiage would say something to the, in, the to the fact that it would be our intention that, that the only thing that might get in the way is structural integrity or, or safety or whatever. Um, it Those is are good a good point. Project. It's a huge project. Right. Tim, you have a comment? Yeah. So that like little in, uh, little insight. The L, uh, the lights on it are standard LED lights. Uh, the cool, not the warm version. Uh, there's nothing out of the way, uh, out of the ordinary in terms of them uh, and their uh, their lighting ability. Um, they'll be solar uh, powered. The just like the uh, the NECA sign that I designed and manufactured, that also went through uh, engineering. So in other words, my design went to an engineer who, in that particular case, we needed to do wind load, and so wind load uh, was done. Uh, the whole thing was the thickness of the steel, etc., was all approved by uh, by an engineer. This would be the same. So in this particular case, I'd probably go to that same individual and say, here's our, here's our concept. What size pipe, what uh, diameter pipe, how thick does the wall have to be in order to have something that's say 16 feet tall, da -da 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 -da. and that person would come back with those for which uh, we would then engineer it. Uh, we would then order the parts to be made to the engineering specs. So. That, that to give you some sense that we're not just uh, putting something up, it has to go through engineering first before we ever manufacture it. Well, that's great to hear, Mel, and I, I, I think the Nekasan is lovely. Tim, <laughs> you want to follow up? I just wanted to say that um, I'm based on the presentation and the history and, and the idea that this is, this is essentially a gift um, and I think we should accept the gift and just ask Peter to confirm that if the select board after we had a few months with this, had a, some sort of problem with the sculpture, we would fully be in our powers to remove the sculpture. But to build in something like that, that sort of suggests that we don't have confidence in the project seems petty to me. Peter, can you give us those? Uh, so um, yeah, without speaking to um, where the majority of the five of you should fall in this discussion on taking proactive action around that question versus knowing that you can do it later, 
it is a fact that you could do that later. I mean, the, the, if the select board made a decision, if, if a select board, you or a future select board made a decision that something that had been allowed in the in the right of way is no longer going to be allowed in the right of way, um, you, you certainly have that authority um, to impose that. And so, um, and, and we could make sure that in your, um, in the implementation of an action you would take tonight, that there wasn't something where the town was um, conveying an indication that this was, you know, for all time, no matter what circumstances, you know, where there would be a conveyance essentially of a public space for private use. That's not what's happening here. We're understanding that there's a, a request for recurring um, permission to place a private object in the public right away for, for the purposes that are being discussed. So in that context, the one thing I think hasn't been discussed around this you know, um, slightly awkward issue of you know, where our sensibilities are about the appropriate um, uh, degree of, of sort of until further notice might be attached to this um, is the, the potential for other locations, right? So we did explore other locations. This is the preferred location for the folks who are proposing the project. Um, I, I think there's also the possibility among the different permutations of how this could unfold, there's the possibility that um, the sculpture might be well received, but there might be a future select board or a, you know, a group of people in the community who say, you know, that's nice, but why does it have to be there? Wouldn't it be great if it was over here? And uh, there might be a time when the permission isn't revoked, but changes. Um, and all of those things remain within the town's authority because what we're talking about here is permission to place something private on property that the town controls. So what I'm hearing Peter say is that my two concerns are addressed um, without any change to the motion that's proposed. Um, Daniel, are you happy to hear what Peter had to say regarding changes in future years as necessary? Yeah, I mean, like Tim, I believe that like if a future select board wanted to make a change to this privately owned thing that's in the public right away, that's well within their um, powers to do so. I guess I just I just wanted to give us an opportunity to try it and see how it goes. And and I really wanted to line up the fact that this is, you know, this is celebrating the centennial. Um, we don't get many requests for privately owned things to be put in public rights of way. Um, we don't have that much streetscape to work with and to make our town look like how we want it to look. And so whilst the Harris Hill ski jump is very meaningful to many people, it is not you know, as meaningful to all people. And so, you know, what we choose to put in these spaces has kind of a lot of meaning attached to it. And I would just like to have the opportunity. I'm not even thinking really about the five of us, honestly. It's like, let's put this up and let's have the community let us know how they feel about it. If the community loves it, then great. I am all for that. But if, if we hear from the community that, you know, some people are less into it, then you know I want to at least have an opportunity to to revisit. Right. That's but, you know that is full cards on the table from me. And and we would have that opportunity on the basis of what is currently being proposed. Mm -hmm. So what I'm saying is, are we ready to vote on what's been proposed? Um, I see some nods. So would someone like to make a motion? I'll make a motion if no one Thank else. Thank you, Tim. Yes. Wasn't expecting to, but that's okay. I move to approve allowing Harris Hill Ski Jump Inc. to install a ski jumper sculpture annually on the median island near Wells Fountain between December 1st and March 1st as presented. All right. All in favor of... Uh, well, Tim has made a motion to approve allowing Harris Hill Ski Jump Inc. to install a ski jumper sculpture annually on the median island near Wells Fountain between December 1 and March 1 as presented. Uh, all, in, 
select board members in favor of that motion, please raise your hand and say aye. 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 Okay, the motion has carried. And again, uh, Patricia and Mel, we thank you for um, this gift thank you. to the town of Brattleboro. We're very thank excited you. about it. And I, I, I anticipate that the town will enthusiastically embrace it. It's going to be such a, a bright and exciting um, celebratory. celebratory. Oh, it's ski jump time in Brattleboro. And I hope someday you can all see and hear the wonderful accolades that we get from people in town and out of town for whom this ski jump is a piece of their, um, it's part of the fabric of this community. And um, thank you. We'll see you on the you. hill. Yeah. And Thanks, I'll harken Jim. back with one last note that uh, Harris Hill was uh, uh, the first uh, <laughs> location for the words project, uh, you know, so we were the premier video and uh, so we are Harris Hill. Harris Hill was the first is, story. Is, is, uh, that was the first story that they uh, produced. So, <laughs> Great. You went and it's lovely if you haven't listened to it. Great. Thanks. All right. Well, thank much. you very much. Thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you. you. Good evening. All right. Now, how about the purchase of a replacement sidewalk tractor for the Public Works Department? Shall how we? About it? Shall we hear from Mr. Tyler? I do. Hello again, Dan. Dan I hear that Dan more. Tyler has an interesting story to tell us. Nope. <laughs> <laughs> on. So, so the sidewalk tractor, this is, uh, it's a 2011, the, the one we're looking to replace. It's up for replacement as part of the capital plan. Um, these sidewalk tractors, they get used pretty heavily in the winter and then they sit all summer long um, with no use at all. So typically we purchase the sidewalk tractor with a snow plow, a snow blower, and a sander. Um, it doesn't allow for really any other use. They make a whole array, array of implements for these machines. Um, it, it's kind of one of those machines that will do anything. Um, they, they have a lot of different implements. A lot of them aren't necessarily useful in our applications, but one that we thought would be is the asphalt coal planer for the front of the sidewalk tractor. And what that is, it's a about two foot wide grinder that allows for um, grinding out asphalt. Um, if you've noticed the, the patching that we just recently did on Western Avenue, that was the process that was used. Um, they went around the patch with a very similar grinder um, and then paved it in. It allows for the asphalt to, to key in better. Um, patch will last longer. So, so we th really think this would be beneficial um, for better long lasting asphalt patches, as well as um, when we do excavation projects, it can be used to grind out the asphalt within the ditch lines. Um, so it just makes the machine much more versatile um, and, and gives us a piece of equipment that would be useful. Um, so we, we advertise the bid for the new sidewalk tractor. Uh, there's, there's, it's a regional um, distributor, or regional dealer kind of situation. So HP Fairfield's the only one that sells them in this area. Um, and this is the same trackless brand that we have currently. Both of our machines are this brand. So we're familiar with them. We've had great luck with them. So we advertised it with the option of including the asphalt planer and one and as option one. And then option two is just how we normally would purchase it with the snowblower plow and sander. Um, there's a significant expense to the asphalt planer um, and you have to add the, the gear reduction box and that has to be added at the time of manufacture. It's not something you can do later. So that's kind of where we've been stuck with our current models is it wasn't built that way. So we can't utilize the available implements. 
Um, so it's about a $31,500 difference between with or without the planer. Um, about 21,000 of that's the planer. The gearbox is about 10.5. And then they're, they're willing to give us an additional 2,500 in trade if we purchase the planer. If we don't, the trade drops. So the, the net difference would be 29,000 from one option or the other. Um, the budgeted amount was 139,000 for the machine. Um, with the with the planer, the price would be 168. Without, it would be 138,840. Um, we are proposing purchasing it with the planer and covering the additional expense with the capital roads paving line item, as that would be what what it would primarily be used for. Great, thank you, Mr. Tyler. Ian. Thanks, Dan. Is the uh, life expectancy of the tractor being utilized in both the winter and the summer going to be less than when we were just using the last one in the winter? It, it, the life expectancy wouldn't change. Um, we, we'd obviously, we put more hours on it. Um, in all reality, it probably, there would be some benefit to using it in the summer and just exercising the machine and, you know, just, we wouldn't, we don't expect to see any difference, any real difference in life expectancy. And likely the planer would be something that might be able to be used when the next purchase comes along. You know, the, the life expectancy of the planer is probably outlast the machine. Oh, that actually is could, okay. Could go on to that. I didn't understand that. Cool. Other select board members have comments? Jessica? Yeah, hey, Dan, thanks. Um, I'm curious about, um, about how this is going to improve our sidewalks. Do you, do you feel like this will improve the, the number of sidewalks that are in good quality or what's the, what's the actual impact going to be on our infrastructure? In terms of winter, um, we currently have two tractors. So that, you know, our, our plow, plowed sidewalks would remain the same. Um, in terms of summer use, the, the mill is most of the sidewalks are concrete, so it wouldn't really apply, you know, it would be used more in roadway applications than it would sidewalk applications in the summertime. Well, I'm a big proponent of, you know, having more versatile equipment but I'm open to more select board comments. Are there more select board comments? Dan? Daniel? It's great. I'm excited. It's a, a more versatile piece of equipment, right? Get more done with it. You know, it's a little bit more money, but I think it's, uh, I think it's money well spent and that the people will benefit. So thank you. Yeah, I think it would improve our pavement preservation program for sure. Our PPP. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I will note that um, under the consent agreement, many of those items were under budget. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, I think there's, pro there's probably a net savings overall from our decisions that we're making tonight. Uh, anyone else have a comment or perhaps a motion? Jessica. I move that we award a bid to HP Fairfield in the total amount of 168,000 for a 2022 trackless MT7 sidewalk tractor with a snowblower, power folding V plow sander, deep reduction gearbox, asphalt cold planer, and a replacement, oh, replacement picks for the planer. I was waiting for those oratory skills to kick in. That was amazing. Thank you, Jessica. That's wonderful. All right. Jessica has moved to award a bid to HB Fairfield in the total amount of $168,000 for a 2022 trackless MT7 sidewalk tractor with snowblower, 
power folding V plow, sander, deep reduction gearbox, asphalt cold planer, and replacement picks for the planer. All select board members in favor of this motion, please raise your hand and say aye. 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 There we are, five that was, zero. That was yeah. good, Liz, but it wasn't. I know. Was well, what are we going to do? We Tough just have to, to go on. Thank you, Dan. It's very yeah. helpful. All right. Thank you, Dan. Uh, draft. Oh, let's. Yes, Dan. Oh, you might beat me to it. I was going to propose that we take a break now. Yes, I was. We are on the Talking same wavelength. Dinner. Yes. So let's take a 10 minute break now. Daniel has a lovely dinner and uh, we'll come back at, you know, five after eight and uh, wrap this baby up. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you. We can reconvene the L well birthday edition of the Rattleboro Select Board. <laughs> <laughs> I'm in trouble. Oh. And, uh, which is there's Jessica. Okay. Um, Peter, would you like to tell us about your draft procedure for dependent care reimbursement for select board members? I would. Um, so just to um, set the context of it um, for those who are watching, um, uh, RTM has several years in a row now considered the compensation for select board members um, at some length. And this year actually did make changes in that compensation, increasing the stipend um, for the chair and the other members and adding a component of compensation um, for reimbursement of dependent care expenses. It was very intentionally called dependent care expenses with the expectation that it might most often be used for childcare expenses, but could also be used for other types of dependents and that it was important in terms of um, achieving the um, accessibility goal that was um, the, the main motivation for this to um, uh, make it possible for people who might have been discouraged by the financial implications of, of um, running for and serving on the select board um, to have less reason to be discour discouraged about that, um, both related to the, the amount of the stipend uh, and the provision of dependent care reimbursement. So the stipend action was very specific. The dependent care action was not, it was just that. It was to allow reimbursement of dependent care expenses. And um, so when we had our annual consideration coming out of town meeting of um, follow-up actions that either the select board or town staff would need to take to implement direction we had received from town meeting this year, um, we agreed back in the first meeting in April that um, sometime around now, um, it may or possibly June, that um, I would return to you with a proposed procedure for this reimbursement process. And, um, and we would you know, figure out at this time what shape to give it as far as how to move forward. In the preparation that I did for this meeting, um, it was pretty clear to me um, the, the three bulleted items that I've put forth here are a sensible, simple way for us to administer this um, reimbursement process. Um, it won't always be the case, particularly with babysitting expenses, but perhaps other expenses as well. It won't always be the case that um, one of you who is entitled to reimbursement and is seeking reimbursement has a receipt to show for it. So um, I thought that the creation of a log We'll, we'll create that form. If you agree to do this in the manner that I've described, we in the town manager's office will create a form and it'll be something that you each can just fill out once a month to submit, to, to sign. You know, you'll tell us what you spent on dependent care expenses and you'll sign it and I'll look it over and approve it and we'll reimburse it through the um, accounts payable process that, that we routinely do each week in the town. That's a way to make this possible without it having being burdensome. And, and so that makes sense to me. And it's an honor system. You're signing on this to say, I incurred these expenses and I'm asking for reimbursement. So um, I would ask that you approve that unless you have an objection to it. If you have an objection to it or question about it, then obviously we'll talk about that in a few minutes. But there's another layer to this that I didn't feel as comfortable 
um, saying it should be X or it should be Y, but I do believe it needs to be addressed by the board so that there's a um, an intentional either um, uh, boundary or an intentional lack of boundary on um, uh, sort of the extent of this benefit that's being provided. Um, and that is that uh, the motion at RTM said um, that there would be a um, reimbursable, you know, that, that it would now be allowed to reimburse um, uh, dependent care expenses, didn't speak either to an overall dollar amount, like for instance, you know, in contrast to the amounts of the stipends, which are very specific, so it's a known cost to the town, um, and didn't speak to what constitutes an um, eligible dependent care expense. And, you know, I'm not going to start randomly naming things that, you know, might or might not fit within a such a boundary, but it seems worth giving some consideration to whether sort of in the eyes of the beholder or whether there's something that's more explicit that, that you as a board would wish to say about what kinds of expenses are uh, eligible for this reimbursement or if there's any kind of expenses that might not be. Um, and so um, on those questions of whether or not there will be a boundary and if so, what sort of boundary, I'm, I'm seeking your direction. I'm, I'm, I'm wanting to know what your collective sensibilities are about that. I think it's appropriate to have some boundary, but if three or four or five of you thought it wasn't, let's just try this and see how it goes. And then maybe you'll be informed for future decision-making about a potential boundary. That's not wrong either, but you know, I need your direction to know where you as a group are on that question. And if you do choose to impose some sort of a boundary, um, I'd be happy to participate in a conversation with you about how that, you know, what that might look like, but I don't come to you with a recommendation on that because it's, um, it's just pretty amorphous. I think it's something that, that it's important for the five of you to decide and wrestle with. Well, isn't like customary and usual the kind of words that people use for things like this? It, those are you, words that are sometimes used in situations like this. I, um, I don't think that informs very well um, what would qualify or what wouldn't. And like I said, if, if the group of you feels we just need to try this for a bit and, and experience it and then make boundary related decisions or not, um, you know, I think that's okay. I just think it's a conscious decision you should make rather than something that just fails to get addressed. Um, but I, I think if you are to address it, I'm, I'm not thinking so much that um, characterizing reimbursement would be a boundary as so much as like each one of you would be eligible to receive up to X dollars per year, perhaps, or um, it, it is, um, you know, for select board meetings and other um, obligations of the board, then any child care expense or any dependent care expense that you choose to incur is reimbursable. But if you decide to have lunch with a constituent and incur some dependent care expenses, that's not reimbursable because it's only those sort of like scheduled select board functions. You know, something like that is what I would envision being the appropriate specific boundaries that would allow us to know what, what's okay and what's not. That sounds good. Dana, you had your hand up? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I, I agree. I think that last definition there sort of meets what I think of as the purpose of this thing. But I would be curious to hear from those who might incur dependent expenses, what their thoughts are. I will not, but... Yeah, I haven't ha hired a babysitter in a long time. Tim? Um, thank you, Liz. I, I have a, a rough proposal for this because I thought about it a lot. And I thought as a goodwill gesture, because as many of you know, I was not in favor of the substantial increase that we received as board members. Um, but uh, I could run through it really quick and just say up front that I don't feel have really strong feelings about it. So I think just to relieve the pressure off the situation. <laughs> um, do you mind? It, it won't be, take me long. Please. 
So thank you. I was thinking that I wanted to do come up with an idea that would encompass three principles. One is do something simple that's fairly easy from an administrative perspective for our employees to not add to their burden. Number two, uh, not too damaging to taxpayers and have some sort of limitations on it, considering that we also received a raise. Uh, but number three, importantly, uh, honor the will of RTM and the intent of reimbursing for dependent care expenses. So, and again, just so to throw it out, I was thinking that it wouldn't be a situation with receipts. I'm not opposed to that idea if that's the way the board wants to go really. Um, but to remove that sort of requirement and the paperwork involved is that when you're hired by, by our constituents to serve on the select board, um, to just say that you have dependent care needs and that you'd like to receive that care um, stipend and to make it a set amount, regardless of whether you have one child or five children, because hopefully there's an efficiency of care going on there, or um, you know an elder care situation. Um, and since I love coming out with simple math, I just was basing this on two meetings a month, based on five hours per meeting, based on fifteen dollars per hour. Now, I don't know what you pay, Jess. We actually pay like twenty typically an hour, at least for. Um, childcare for, for our son. But when you do the math that way, it does come out to 150 a month. And that comes out to $1,800 a year. So in my proposal, it's a yes or no. If you have a dependent care situation, this is the stipend you get. And it's not a, it's not a max. It doesn't require proof, a monthly, uh, submission of receipts, etc. Uh, the receipt idea might be cheaper, frankly, for taxpayers. Um, but what it does do is sort of force you to make decisions on like, like right now, my wife is taking care of our son. But is it all right to apply the spirit of this to us going out to eat tomorrow because of that, you know, it's sort of levy, leveling the playing field of all the things we juggle as parents or as people with elder care responsibilities. So just an idea um, to make it straightforward, keep it simple, honor the will of RTM certainly, um, but also, you know, reimburse those with extra time constraints, et cetera. Um, you know, it's an interesting theory, Tim, and I appreciate you spending the time to think about it. Um, I just kind of wonder whether, whether it's needed at every meeting, you know, I mean, it's like, I don't even know where to begin, but like, let's just say for you would have to sign on to have dependent care all the time or none of the time. And like, let's say I had a need to care for someone in my household on a very temporary basis. You know, that would be a temporary need that I could log, you know, and it would be exceptional. But um, I could see some people would need a babysitter all the time, but maybe some people wouldn't need a babysitter all the time. And so that's why I was thinking that the, the logging in would be better than this set rate. I never thought it would be co this complicated, actually. I just thought it would be, you know, reimbursed for babysitting services rendered type of thing. I'd be curious to hear from Peter. I think Tim, you're you're solving a problem of extra work, um, and I just want to hear from Peter about how he feels about that. Um, 
what Tim proposes would certainly be simpler. Um, and it's also true that um, I gave some thought to keeping it simple when I proposed the log system. And that's something that I would personally handle. You know, we, we in the town manager's office would receive those logs from you. I would do the review. I would approve it and send it down to finance. Finance is going to cut the check either way. So it's, it's not the, the additional burden to the degree that there is any is the town managers. And frankly, I think that's appropriate because I think there will almost never be a question about the logs. But if there's a question about the logs, I think that's a conversation that the town manager and a select board member ought to have and not be something any other staff member has to have with you. So um, that's why I proposed it the way I did. I'm actually completely comfortable either way. I've been listening to what Tim presented. I was listening to Liz's response and they both seem really reasonable to me. And that's what makes this tricky is, you know, we're creating something new with limited guidance and it's going to have to be a, a, a gut level decision for the five of you as much as a informed decision, I think. Ian. Um, first off, I definitely defer to my fellow select board members who have uh, uh, children or dependent care needs. Um, I feel like I am probably the least qualified person on this board to talk about this, really. Um, the thing I, uh, just something that came to mind, Tim, looking at your proposal is um, it denies us an opportunity to collect data on it, which it being a new thing um, is maybe a downside. Uh, and, and, and by data, I mean, just like to see how select, a select board member utilizes this, um, which may be useful, I don't know, um, but just doing it as a stipend or as a set amount each month um, doesn't give us that opportunity. I, I, I can see that point. Daniel. Um, I'm imagining, Tim, that, that that your proposal is a way of at least us being able to predict what these costs are likely to be, and that's like a good thing, right? Like we wouldn't do the general fund budget on a we'll see how it goes kind of basis. <laughs> um, that would be bad. And in this case, like I I think Ian's point about like, yeah, collecting information, you know, what is the need? not so much like monitoring an individual's usage of this, but more like at the end of the fiscal year, we'll be able to say, oh, okay, so this is what it costs in the first year. And maybe then the next year we could sort of budget for it um, in a, you know, in a kind of ongoing way. Um, I also like, and I guess this ties way back to the beginning when we were talking about masks, I kind of like the honor system. Um, in that I trust the honor of the people that get elected to this body. Um, you know, I don't think that anyone who's currently serving on this board would abuse this system to, to get rich. Um, <laughs> and I would like to think, and I do think that like future people who are going to run for the select board are not running for the select board because they want to abuse the dependent care stipend. Um, and so the public put a lot of trust in us in electing us. I trust that we will be responsible with this and we'd only submit for what we needed to submit for. I don't know, like I drive around for work sometimes and I don't submit those miles because it's like, I like driving and it's fun to go to places and I don't need the money for gas. I, you know, so people will submit what they need and I'm going to trust them that they're going to ask for what they need. Tim, you have a comment. Thank you, Daniel. I, I think I might just admit that when I started to think about this, I wasn't sure, like when I when I think about the receipt, and, or not receipts maybe, but log, um, where you just say that I used this. this. Um, I'm not sure how that translates with you, Jessica, but in my family, you know, five years of, depending on my wife to do the bath night, to do everything from possibly, actually today, 5 p.m. till whenever we're done, you know. Um, then if she's here, then I don't need to submit a log, or do I? Because it really does cumulatively add up to a stress on our family 
And I think that's the spirit of the RTMs thing, as well as enabling people who couldn't, you know, wouldn't consider running for select board, perhaps to feel like, oh, they're being backed up a little bit on that kind of familial relationship situation. So now if we go to the log thing or receipts, whatever, I'm not sure if I should or I shouldn't, or should I only do one a month versus two? Or you know what I mean? Because I'm lucky enough to to, do, to have a, a partner that's helping with childcare, who's quite good at it and better than any babysitter, of course. But um, so now then I'm stuck in a personal. Yeah, how does Jess? How do you feel about? It? Yeah, I definitely hear you, and um, and also like the the cost of babysitting can be can vary wildly, and elder care in the evening hours, sort of outside of a normal work schedule. Um, so I'm wondering if there's like a, there's like a hybrid that we could do something that does log it. Um, but um, I'm, I'm just wondering if the select board could set a, a hourly care rate. So when you send in your message to Peter each month, you can say, we had this many hours of childcare or elder care, and we had a X number of meals and the select board, we, we set a policy where we reimburse those at certain levels. Daniel? I'm gonna say this in a nice way. Let me, let me see. I'm really against it because sort of like the kind of situation that Liz was describing, you know, maybe for babysitting, there's like a, a reasonable range we could imagine. But if there's a situation where there's a temporary need for dependent care and it's like, you know, maybe somebody, an elderly member of your family or something had like something really awful happened to them and they need to have, you know, a, a nurse in there or something like that. Um, I wouldn't want to like say, well, you can only get, 15 bucks an hour for that person. Like what if that person costs like $200 an hour and it's not something that's needed all the time. I, I just, I think it would be interesting to be as free as possible with this. And I also got really excited as Tim was describing his situation that like maybe it would be a way of actually paying people for the labor that they do in their homes that is never compensated. I think they call and, it. And that's a wild work. notion. Imagine. Yeah. Mm. Mm. Uh, yeah well I, i'd like that idea too you know what i think i think we could have some sort of a hybrid that jessica was suggesting and and um uh tim's suggestion would be kind of the you know the suggested amount like the reasonable and customary amount would be what he was describing in terms of two meetings a week, five hours of blah, blah, blah. That whole calculation would be kind of the norm, but that there would also be an opportunity for the log system where people have unusual needs. Uh, they could also be, you know, submitted and, and, and reimbursed. So it's kind of both. You could be, in the, in the normal, you know, dependent care system. And then there might be some sort of extraordinary or temporary events as well. Might be something that we want to like think about for the next meeting. There, because there was another piece that I, I wanted to address as well that I think is just being in a, um, addressed as an assumption but I think that um, to do this job well and you know, do the effort and work needed and read through these however many pages of, of materials, that also takes time and energy and focus and time away from children or care situations. Um, so I think that you know, in, the, in the calculation of hours on, in Tim's you know, version of it, I feel like it needs to it needs to take into account more than just select board meeting hours. You know, I I, I would think that that would be within our increased stipend. 
you know, the, the, the background reading and the preparation. I think that's, that's what our, our background stipend is for, which is kind of separate from the actual dependent care. But um, Tim, did you have a comment? It's sort of what you said. I, I think it just gets into the weeds of what, what is dependent care and what is stipend and what is salary. I mean, we had this difficulty at RTM, you know, because as a fiscally conservative um, board member, I would say that the stipend is supposed to be um, cover what it needs to cover, you know, help you with your needs. But if you get into the weeds of, well, should a, if it's a child, if it's a childcare situation and you, and you go beyond the, what I was describing as 10 hours per month of pretty much guaranteed screen time, if we're not in person, um, then you really do sort of, there's, there's a great difference of, of hours that people spend and you could go down a slippery slope. I hate that term too, but of whether or not discussions about, you know, things with constituents counts, whether or not, you know, pulling yourself away from your family to study your notebook counts. Um, it, it's pretty hard to uh, find a common ground with that kind of idea. Um, All right. Well, let's hear from these two members of the public. Let's go to Kate first, because we've already heard from Gary tonight, and we'll hear him second. Kate O'Connor. Come on down. I had like no intention of talking about this, so I look really bad. Um, but <laughs> <laughs> I just want to, it's, it's like been a really interesting discussion. And I think what concerns me a little is that, and I, you touched on this, I think, Elizabeth, that the, the salaries or, or compensation for the select board members was increased a lot. And so I think, you know, getting reimbursed for everything, the, you know, extra reimbursement for everything the select board does on the hours, I don't think that's the way to go. But I also, with Tim's proposal, I think it's really, and this is going to, might sound contradictory, but I, I look at what the Vermont legislature does and they offer, you know, up to, I'm making this up, but offer up to like $63 a day in meals. And what you're supposed to do is actually get reimbursed for what you spend, but you could spend $14, but still get the 63. And I've always had a, a real problem with that. You know what I mean? So to me, I would encourage you to be as actual expenses as possible, um, you know, because to, 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 and I know you're not doing what the Vermont legislature does, but if you're not using the resources for the amount of time that you say, I, I just, as a taxpayer, I know it might be even more, I might be even asking you to spend more money, but there's something that's always bothered me about you have up to a certain stipend and people don't use it, but they still take the whole thing. So I know that probably doesn't make any sense because I didn't even expect to be here tonight, but um, that's just off the top of my head comments. Thank you, Kate. Um, Gary? Do you have a comment to make? Yeah, I can understand what Tim is saying, was saying, and also what uh, Jessica and what Daniel Quip, a long time ago, my daughter was going to early education here on Canal Street. I was a policy council president, which basically that's a PTA president. And I had to basically do what you guys were doing. But early education provided daycare and meals uh, in that aspect. And I understand what Tim is saying too, because, you know, you know, when my daughter was with me, we should, I just had to make sure she was well taken care of and that she was fed. And we went to Bird Street and I was with dedicated dads also. And that was an awesome pro program also, which supported, you know, childcare. And as Jessica was saying, as Daniel was saying, and you were saying too, Elizabeth, life situations happen. Um, surgeries, accidents that you might need biota, you might need um, someone to come in and to care for somebody. Or like when I had surgery, I had to have a visiting nurse. And that I think I highly say that's a good idea because 
you know, you guys will be able to perform your duties to the fullest extent, having that security, that's that, that support in, pl in place. But maybe if you see or do like a research or course analysis of areas of how much these type of cares cost, that might give you a better direction on how much you need to spend and what you're looking at in that guy. Does that make any sense? Sure. I mean, because I, I, yeah, mean the, I, yeah. I'm, I'm sorry, go I, ahead, Elizabeth. Well, it's just becoming clear to me that this is not the slam dunk that I thought it was going to be. <laughs> it's more complicated and, um, you know, there's there's just a lot going on. And, and I right. would like to see if we want to vote on this now or we want to wait two weeks and see what we all think, uh, having had some time to think about it and maybe Peter can come up with some sort of a hybrid system. And, what, but, and like what Tim would say, it would be at your discretion. You know if you need that care, if it's necessary. And, you know, you would use it systematically if I need that care for that night. But when you were mentioning that, you know, if you're doing assignments at home, should you get paid? I know I, I was trying to understand what Jessica was saying. I think that's something that's already incorporated with your payment because that's part of your duty. So for you to get an extra course for doing assignments at home, that kind of goes off tangent to saying that's an extra course for doing some type of, you know, work and studying and all that that you have to do as a select board member. But okay, Gary, thank I, you. I just wanted yeah. to make sure that that was what she was saying, Jessica. Yeah, it, it wasn't about me doing the work. It is about finding someone to take care of my child while I do the work. Right, right. Child care is very important. Right. So it's Daniel outside. Thank you guys. Thank you, Gary. Thanks, Liz. Um, so in the memo that Peter wrote, um, he says, I propose that this procedure initially either be limited to dependent care during select board means or applied more broadly to select board activities, but with a dollar limit per person. Given my choice and i do have a choice i guess i would just say limit it to dependent care during select board meetings and mm -hmm. and take the proposal that peter put forward with the log and like people will ask for reimbursement of what they need and and at the end of the year we will know where we stand with that and if the amount is wicked high and we can't um you know we can't sort of imagine moving forward with that we can revisit but for the first time we've ever done this, I think it'd be nicer to just collect it in a more expansive way. You know, that's interesting because kind of bringing it home and collecting the data that Ian talked about. Ian, did you have a comment? Yes, I want to back uh, select board member Quip's uh, proposal. I think um, I, I really want to double down on the idea that we in Brattleboro are leaders in this particular area. And we have an opportunity to provide data and information for other communities uh, who don't currently provide for uh, child or uh, dependent care. And I think being more broad and allowing people to more individualize what they need will be more beneficial for more people and uh, will hopefully help to encourage other communities to do what we're doing here. I also want to say that my support for this is entirely attached to doing both uh, the stipend and this on a monthly basis. Yeah, we haven't discussed the monthly basis, but- And I, uh, I'm happy to bring that up right now if you'd like me to, but um, it looks like Tim wants to speak. Tim. We can't hear you. Oh. We can't hear you, Tim. <laughs> Sorry about that. Didn't Daniel say, Daniel, did you say that you were in favor of limiting it to only during select board meetings? Yes. And Ian is also in favor of that. Okay, that was a clarification I needed. Thank you. I, I just think that's simpler. And yeah. Okay, so let's just go back to this monthly idea, which I think is great, because I think it's in the spirit of what RTM wanted. And I think that not only this dependent care monthly, but our stipends in general, you know, in order for it to be more useful to the person who are receiving it, to have it on a regular basis makes all the sense in the world. Ian? Yeah, I'll just reiterate, yeah, exactly. 
in the spirit of RTM, they raised the stipend so that people who would re would rely on it for potentially monthly expenses could actually run for select board. So it makes no sense to dole it out twice a year. Um, <laughs> it should be something that someone can rely on. So I'd like to, I'd, I'd really, I think that this is, I think this conversation has been really interesting and I'm, I, I would really encourage us moving forward with it tonight. Great. Do we have enough nods for someone to make a motion? Oh, Tim, go ahead. One, one clarification. Yes. Uh, does that involve coming to an, a cap idea or we're not? No, so we're, we're gonna, proposing I think that we there... should go honor system until we have such a okay, but amount in theory, of data. In theory, there is a cap because we are limiting it only to select board meeting hours, correct? Yes. So there's a rough there's cap. There's that. Okay. And, and, and that cap would be the uh, math, math that you proposed. Oh, okay. Well, I don't no. know, Peter's- <laughs> Peter's saying something about it. Let's <laughs> let Peter weigh in. I didn't understand what I thought was emerging as a consensus to include the, the, the sort of prescriptive math. What I understood was, you know, we had a series of meetings last year that were weekly instead of every other week and that were consistently going to or past 11 o'clock at night. And under those circumstances, all of that would be reimbursable, which would lead to a bigger bill, but for the reason that the work was a greater burden. And if we're fortunate to have a you know series, several months go by and we're only meeting twice a month and we're only meeting for three or four hours, then the amount of reimbursable time becomes less because the in-meeting time is less. That's what I understood to be emerging. That's seeing true. Seeing odds around that. Um, I, I would also just um, uh, indicate that the the tracking of the reimbursement separate from the stipends will be a piece of cake for us. It's going to be easy. And I just won't go further into the weeds on that, except to say the kind of, of data you're looking for in a way that isn't um, uh, specific to an individual select board member is going to be easy for everyone to see at a glance. The other data also will be available. I mean, those are going to be public records, these logs that you submit. So, you know, if somebody wants to dig deeper into the weeds, they'd be allowed to. But what we will be reporting out to you is going to make it easy for you and for the public to understand what the magnitude of this is for this select board. Okay. Great. Ian? Yeah, I just wanted to, uh, I just wanted to build on that. Peter, because I really appreciate that distinction. When I'm thinking about the data, I'm not thinking like policing individuals here. I'm thinking, yep. you know, you have a general sense for, okay, Brattleboro actually provides this service and wow, it's really actually doesn't break the bank here. This is something that maybe we could implement in our select board or something like that. It's not, mm -hmm. I'm not looking at it like at individuals or something like that. That's really wasn't the heart of what I'm trying to get at. No, I thought it was more of, is this, idea being used and and we want data that it is actually useful and necessary tim oh sorry jess do you want to go first yeah i wanted to open a can of worms why don't you go first okay well I don't, this uh, might be a can of worms but i don't think so so i just want to make clear the cap there is no cap to our submissions but is there a cap to hourly rate no, really? no, the, because I, don't think I can support it then. So, OK, okay. that's a, that's OK. OK, can I just say why I think that's important? Um, yeah, sure. You know, you, you spoke yourself that the the babysitter that you use costs, you know, more more per hour than you are willing to, you know, a lot for that service. And each family, each household, each individual is going to have a different person that they trust a different service that they trust that's going to cost what it costs the purpose of this is to provide for you know a member of this board to be able to focus entirely on their board duties and that you know a member of their family who needs care to get the care that they need i'm not worried about this break in the bank um i mean i mean if it, Maybe we'll get a bad run of it. Maybe we'll have five board members who all have 
very expensive dependent care needs and that board can wrestle with that issue but for this year i'm not too concerned that we're going to break the bank on this and it can be revisited right just like just like, just like the skier everything. with the christmas lights yeah So, um, Jessica, your worms. worms. I wanted to open was just um, something that came up earlier that I think Daniel brought up, or maybe Tim, was about um, what what qualifies as um, something that can be reimbursed under this program. Is it some person outside of your family who specifically provides care services? Or is it broader than that? Does it include meals? Does it include, you know, partners? Does it include, what, what does it include? That's the I would say it. it's an expense that you need help with, right? Like I talked about my mileage expenses, how I don't bother seeking reimbursement for them because I just don't need it, you know? But if getting reimbursed for these expenses is a thing that, you need in your life, I'm going to trust that you'll report that in an honorable way and account for it however you may. <laughs> That's not going to be popular with everybody, but, Wait, but you, I don't know. Didn't you start by saying it would only apply to select board hour meeting? Hour? Yes. Yes. So how, I'm, I'm trying to... What the thing is, you know, I mean, I think essentially that what RTM was talking about was most likely a single parent household. But we can be broader than that because, you know, we understand that, you know, there's a value to uh, uh, the second parent's work in terms of in service to your select board service. So in that sense, it's broader, but the narrow focus would be on the actual select board meeting hours. Peter? I think there is room for that interpretation. And I think it would be helpful for the board in under the part of the um, administrative report where um, I, I have suggested to you tonight two specific motions. It sounds like you might be inclined to approve both of those, uh, at least a majority of you. And then other motions, TBD. Um, there, I would suggest, based on what I've heard, two additional motions so that you as a board make these two elements crystal clear. One being that the hours that are applicable to when you're eligible to, to submit for reimbursed expenses are those that are the hours of the select board meetings, whatsoever they may be. Um, and secondly, that... Um, services provided by a member of the household qualify for reimbursement at a rate that each of you individually will need to just determine what you're comfortable with based on what you pay babysitters when you hire babysitters or some other sort of standard that, you know, you're not going to ask for hundreds of dollars an hour, but you're going to ask for something that you feel comfortable putting down on a piece of paper and signing. If you intend to have it be that broad, and I think that's wise, I think that's fair. Um, I think I'm hearing a majority of you support that. Um, then I think it's important that you declare it so that it can be very clear that when someone puts on their log, you know, four hours at $20 an hour, when they know what they're submitting, I won't know that what they're submitting is that it's, you know, their partner or another family member instead of an actual babysitter, because we're not requiring receipts, but just so that our, um, fair application of the honor system and that those of you participating know what is allowed in the system in which you're participating. I think it would be helpful for you to be very clear about that, that an in-kind uh, burden that's borne by a family member is still a burden. And um, some households are able to address this need that way and other households are not. And so part of providing this support for participation as a select board member um, is allowing a member to put down those hours at a rate that you feel is a reasonable reimbursement to request. Do you have potential additional motions? I, that 
I, yeah, I'll, I'll be happy to offer them. I'll need a minute to just compose that into a much more efficient thought, but I'd be happy to offer them in a way that you could say so moved to when we get there. Anyone have any more discussion on that while Peter's collecting his thoughts? Ian. Uh, I would be very interested in trying to make this a unanimous vote. So I'm curious, Tim, <laughs> if, um, from where it's at, if you would be willing to vote in favor. Wow. Especially as one of the two members who actually would utilize yeah. this. <laughs> I don't know. I, I, I'm going to have to rescind my comment that I made that I don't care that much about this. Because <laughs> clearly, now I care. Um, I, you know, I, I, I guess I keep going back to what's a stipend and what's a salary. And I know it, it gets called different things in different spots in our charter and, and town meeting. And, and I know a lot of people disagree with me when I say that if it's a time in your life that you can give to the town on the select board, then that's what you should do. And when it's a time in your life that you can't, then you shouldn't do it. Um, but given the fact that um, regular select board members received an over, I don't know the math, 100, over 140% increase, so more than doubled regular select board members. Um, for our stipend or however you'd like to characterize it. I'm not comfortable with the no cap situation, so. You know, the, it's, it's interesting because I think that Peter identified what the problem with the cap was. I mean, because I was thinking that, you know, reasonable expenses would be the math that you presented, but gosh, last year was not a reasonable, yeah display of, of select board hours. So it certainly would have been reasonable for us to have weekly, you know, we had weekly meetings that were five to seven hours long. So. Well, that's why in my trying to make it simple, um, it was either, yes, I need this stipend and here's the stipend yearly, monthly, but it translates to yearly. Or no, I don't need this stipend. Yeah. Ooh. And I would prefer so, the actual, you know, the log type. Yeah, I'm not opposed to the log. I think it still leaves, you know, the onus on the struggling with, you know, how much value is it? You know, in reality, I I am going to put my son to bed the next two nights. And that's how we kind of balance the the full five hours tonight, you know. So you do that every day in your life, you know, when you're, when you're co-parenting and when you're a single parent, yeah, that's, a, it's much more real and much more trackable expense. So now I'm like, well, yeah, I don't know what I should take and when. Yeah. Well, you know what, but we're going, why don't, why doesn't, as a select board, we decide that, 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 that opportunity is available to you and then you wrestle with it. Sure. But I don't like that from the taxpayer's perspective. But, but we, you know, as, as Daniel pointed out, you know, this is the honor system and, and you get to decide what's reasonable and you're going to log it and, and you're going to be held to it. And, and we're going to, you know, we've set the parameters for you. Mm -hmm. Daniel? Well, I don't, Ian's really invested in the unanimous vote, so. I, I mean, it. well, I mean, I think it's just, uh, it, I, as one of the two members who does, would utilize this, it's important to me that we at least hear you out. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, it sounds like you're not going to get us on the yearly uh, um, cap, but um, an hourly cap, like, is that also something that sounds like the board doesn't have a will for um or a or a per hour cap well i guess that's what i meant oh wait uh, like a rate cap yeah yes okay. that's what i meant daniel did you have your hand up yeah i did i think it's entirely reasonable for tim to both have a dependent who needs care and want to have a policy that has a cap to you know 
to take care of the taxpayers. And I think those two things can exist. And Tim doesn't have to vote for this, as it seems there's a consensus building around something that he doesn't necessarily feel excited about. One of the ways that we keep meetings going long is by trying to find a 5-0 vote on something that's a 4-1 vote. It's okay, you know, and this board will, um, will do what it needs to do. Tim will wrestle with whether he needs to get reimbursed for any of his dependent care. And that's Tim's business. It's not my business. I wonder. Yes, okay. I guess it's the taxpayer's business eventually, but like that's a little further down the road. Yeah, but I mean, that's where the trust and the honor comes right. in. Jessica? I wonder if we set a rate for regular care dependents that is a huge range, like between 10 and $30 an hour. Um, and you can log regular dependent care within that range. But then there may be special circumstances where someone needs care that goes above and beyond that rate and that can get logged differently. Tanya? I just wanna trust that families know what they need. Every family is different. Some families have you know, people who need very specialist care and I don't want to like impose some kind of limit on those. Families. It may be the greatest ever select board member that has never been is out there and has care needs that are not met by those kinds of things on a regular basis. And I just don't see the need for capping it at this time. I think one of the things I'm hearing from Tim is, correct me if I'm wrong, that the vagueness of it makes it hard to take up space, makes it hard to claim an amount or claim a value to particularly maybe a okay. part of this work. So I how, do we, how do we feel then about all the parameters that we set? Select board meetings only. Put, put a, a suggested rate of $20 an hour for babysitting and allow for exceptions for particular types of dependent care and have it monthly and call it a day. Are that are those all the all the fingers? Peter. I'm sorry. I begin <laughs> this moment with I'm sorry. <laughs> um the the setting up parameters around the rate and having an asterisk on it that says, except when there's special circumstances, moves us into territory that, that for, you know, as far as oversight of this, right, it's gonna be my job to look at your logs. And, and if it is more, show me what you incurred including in kind for your household, if that's a, if something that three of you feel good about and not including that, if it's not something three of you feel good about, then, you know, my double check on you is moments, right? I'm looking to make sure that it doesn't look like you had three meetings on here when there were only two. And so there's some misunderstanding. And so I check with you about that, but otherwise, you know, it's a glance and it matches up with, you know, the work that we did together and, off it goes because you are on your honor system accounting for what you incurred as an actual expense or an in-kind expense if the in-kind expenses are allowed. But if we get into where we're actually administering something that is, you know, sort of more like a, um, you know, tax code kind of situation where, you know, if this, then that, and I've got to double check, I'm concerned that it becomes bureaucratic quickly um, so I, I, I'm not trying to talk you into particular decisions on those particular questions we've been wrestling with, but I am asking that you try not to make the procedure for administering this more complicated. So in furtherance of that, Peter, do you have suggested motions for us? I think there is, um, relative consensus, maybe full 5-0 consensus on this applying to select board members, uh, to select board meetings only. 
I feel less confident about that as it relates to the in-kind expense question. But, you know, maybe I have misread the five of you and there's actually a more complicated thing going on with both questions. But that's my sense. I think there's a majority for both of those. I think so too. I'm not, I'm not confident there's a unanimous vote on the um, in-kind piece. And then what else is necessary? That's it. If you if you were to add those two motions and adopt the two that I proposed, I think we have a workable system to give a try, do some tracking. Come budget time, you can see how we're doing with FY22 and decide what you think is an appropriate amount to budget for this for FY23. I mean, we'll bring you a number that we think is an appropriate amount, and you can decide whether that looks reasonable to you. Tim? Would you prefer a uh, permit a Hail Mary? <laughs> My Hail Mary is, this is a super complicated question and RTM told us to do this thing, didn't define it. So in 10 months, they should define it. I, I don't like that. In not, in, in <laughs> not, in not implemented at all now. Correct. Oh, no, 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 no. That's not the will of the RTM. No, we have to no, do this. We don't know what the will of the RTM is because this wasn't our idea. They wanted us to enact a workable system. And Peter has identified a workable system and he has two tweaks to it. That he told you it was a Hail Mary. That, will, that Peter will read all the motions for us and then we can say so moved. Okay, ready? Only Ready. Yes. Clear things from RTM. <laughs> okay. Um, actually, why don't you proceed with the two that are written, and then I will offer two more after that. Great. Do we have a motion reader, Daniel? I'll read. I'll read them. I just want to check in the first one, where it says dependent care expenses related to their participation in town business. Is that clear that we're talking about select board meetings or well, do you want to define that more? Yeah, thank you, Daniel. Actually, that'll save us. That, then we'll only have to do one more instead of two more if you change participation in town business to be participation in select board meetings. Mm -hmm. Nice, okay. Ken. Thank you. Can you just right. tell me where are we reading from? Uh, the, the administrative the report. Administrative the last report. Page. Page four Item four. C, motion one. I think I'm not looking at that because I don't know why. Well, Daniel will read it. Do you want a minute to, to get it? Well, I, I'm confused what I'm looking at that's different than maybe. Well, Daniel will read it. Yeah, go ahead. And, and then Liz will read it again. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I move to approve the procedure proposed by town manager Alwell for reimbursing select board members who incur dependent care expenses related to their participation in select board meetings. Do you okay. want me to do the next one as well? Yeah, you might as well. Okay. I further move to approve having the select board stipend and dependent care reimbursement paid monthly. Thank you, Daniel. Welcome. Okay. Daniel has actually made two motions. The first, to approve the procedure proposed by town manager Elwell for reimbursing select board members who incur dependent care expenses related to the participation in select board meetings. Daniel further moved that to approve having the select board stipend and dependent care reimbursement paid monthly. Have you found that? Oh Tim? yes, thank you. I was on the wrong. Okay. Document, sorry. Are we ready for a vote? Okay. All those in favor of both motions. Ooh. Oh, oh. Can we do that? Are we doing it one, one at, a time? at a time? All right. All those in favor of the first motion, please raise your hand and say aye. 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 Okay. The, uh, all those not in favor? Next. No. Okay. The vote is four to one. Now for the second motion uh, regarding monthly payments, all in select board members in favor, please raise your hand and say aye. 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 Okay, there we are, five zero. Now, Peter, there's another. Um, 
I believe so. I'll, I'll form a motion that I think a majority of you have voiced support for. And if somebody wants to move it, you'll just say so moved and we'll find out whether there's a majority that supports it. And that is to allow on your reimbursement logs entries that reflect um, the uh, value a dollar, a dollar value that reflects a dollar value for um, dependent care services provided by members of your household. So moved. <laughs> does that need to be a motion? Yes. I think it does because um, the Our motions intention. that have been made so far wouldn't explicitly allow that. And the fact that we're talking about reimbursement, I think technically would preclude it if you don't as a group declare that it is included. Our intention needs to be clear. Yes. Okay. Did someone say so moved? I did. Okay, thank you. Uh, all in favor of the third motion regarding dependent care, Please raise your hand and say aye. 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 All not in favor of the third motion, please raise your hand. Aye. Okay, there we are. Four to Nay, one. Nay, I mean, sorry. Nay, yeah. <laughs> All right, all those motions have passed. Thank you very much. Um, now, for our grand finale, <laughs> Peter will announce the committee vacancies. I will, and... Before I run through the list, um, let me just say so people understand why it sounds so different from usual. Once a year, we have a very long list of vacancies to read because it doesn't just include those seats that are currently vacant. It also includes those seats that will become vacant on June 30th at the end of the fiscal year. And so as we have staggered terms and there's always some seats that are expiring at the end of the fiscal year, this list that we read in May is long. Um, you'll be making lots of appointments in June and perhaps beyond, but hopefully at both June meetings um, to fill these slots because of the fact that there's an annual turnover that's about that. Okay. Peter, before you start, can, I, can you just unmute Ian? Sorry. Uh, um, I can't. Oh, I thought um, you but, were just waving oh, to us, Ian. Hey. There we go. Thank you. There we go. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry. Okay, so bear with me, but here it comes. Um, and it actually, um, unless the select board objects, I think what I'll do is name the, the um, boards and positions, but not name the number of vacancies for each, just as a time saver. But I'll, I'll, I'll read the number of vacancies if you think that's important. No. no. Okay. What, what we're doing here is alerting the public to the fact that there is an opportunity. If you're interested in one of these topics, there's an opportunity to apply to be a member there. And I think that's equally true, whether it's one seat or five seats that are available. Agricultural Advisory Board. Agricultural Advisory Board ex officio members. Those are three non-voting members representing certain uh, particular classifications. ADA Advisory Committee, Arts Committee, Brattleboro Housing Partnerships Board of Commissioners, Cemetery Committee, Citizen Police Communications Committee, Conservation Commission, Design Review Committee, Design Review Committee Alternates, Development Review Board, Development Review Board Alternates, Energy Committee, Fence Viewers, Hazard Mitigation Committee, Honor Roll, Inspector of Lumber, Shingles and Wood, Planning Commission, Recreation and Parks Board, Rescue Inc. Trustee, Senior Solutions Advisory Council, Traffic Safety Committee, Tree Advisory Committee, 
and a weigher of coal. Okay. Okay, town, you heard it here. Volunteer. Thank you, Peter. Sure. Ian? I have a motion if the board's ready. <laughs> All right. I will entertain Ian's motion. I move to adjourn. Thank you, Ian. All in favor, say aye. 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 Thank you all very much. Thank you, Peter. Thank you, interpreters. Thank you, press, town staff. Good evening.